Hi, this is Dr. Lisa Naj, and I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, and we're finishing up a lecture I began yesterday with a little bit more detail about my story, as well as uh, treatment modalities used in environmental medicine to help uh, people with chemical sensitivity. And I think that the reason it's so important is that it's not just these severely Ill, Ill people that it affects or is useful for, it's the average person in everyday life who has mild symptoms, which could be anxiety, uh, being depressed, um, having difficulty with the smell of perfume or cigarette smoke, um, people who fall asleep after meals, people who have autoimmune disease. So this is a subject which is really important to all of us. And I'm using my severe case to garner interest in the subject matter. So as I was saying the other day, um, I'm going to um, go into some detail about my story because I didn't really finish it, um, and then treatments. These treatments are appropriate in any person with a chronic illness when the history and work, workup indicates it and the patient desires such treatment. Specific therapies are geared to the mechanism of the condition and of course be added, like surgical procedures, medications, and other helpful modalities. In the last lecture, I touched on my story, but did not fully describe it due to time constraints. So I'm completing it now, and I did not only have adrenal insufficiency, as we see on this slide, and was diagnosed with Addison's disease, but so did my husband and dog. Therefore, it's likely that this was an environmentally induced adrenal insufficiency. I then had a muscle biopsy because I still had trouble uh, doing activities and, and CORTEF or the treatment for the adrenal insufficiency did not fix everything as I had hoped it would. The uh, muscle biopsy showed anoxic mitochondria. This was also environmentally induced. I had profound muscular weakness to the point that squats or any repetitive motion like turning a can opener or brushing my teeth were impossible. Um, I later had a tilt table test which documented severe dysautonomia, which many people have walking around in daily life, may have mild dysautonomia, let's say, where they have difficulty standing up and maintaining their heart rate and blood pressure normally. I will discuss it in detail later with treatment. Finally, when I stopped using perfume and scented products, I became aware that I was chemically sensitive. I was not aware of this for years when I was sick. I will describe what it's like in more detail right now. I think it's important because people really don't understand what it's like to be intolerant of a chemical. So when a bus drives in front of a car that I'm driving and the diesel exhaust enters the car, I would notice maybe a headache, maybe sleepiness. But then when I was uh, very sick, I went to Dallas for treatment. I was on a highway and the smell of the diesel exhaust was noticeable to me and my arms dropped off the steering wheel due to weakness. I drove home holding the bottom of the wheel. Other times I would smell things like antique wood, which obviously has a moldy smell, newspapers or polyurethane, and I would develop an immediate headache. The mail made my hands itch and I could not open it without perianal itching. I was on the internet and I read about this symptom and that's how I realized I had chemical sensitivity because this was such a bizarre symptom and I had no idea how to explain it. Um, also, foods gave me a headache like red wine, cashews, peanuts. I had headaches five times a day and I was incapacitated. I would smell a cleaning product and become agitated and angry. I wanted to urinate or sometimes defecate on exposure and had to find a bathroom in the public, uh, you know, on a public street which illustrates the effect on the autonomic nervous system. These are common responses that other people have as well. This is not just a syndrome that I alone had. I also developed an intolerance to electrical appliances that had magnetic fields and some with electric fields. This means that fluorescent lights made me sleepy and I didn't like them. Motors, fans, anything that spun or had a magnetic field. Then the cell phone would heat up extraordinarily in my hand and I couldn't hold it or the earbud would burn my ear. This is common in many people in society now and if they take the hot cell phone and hand it to their husband let's say the husband will not interpret the heat the same way as the 
electrically sensitive person. 30% of chemically sensitive people have electrical sensitivity to some degree, and they don't realize it until we start to discuss it. So I know it's controversial, but I'm bringing it up today. When I was very ill and went for treatment, I had stroke-like symptoms while I was using the cell phone. Every time I turned it on, I noticed zigzaggy lines and narrowing of my field of vision, and I was scared that I was having a stroke. By the time I did this three times, I realized it was related to the cell phone use. Then when I went to the clinic for treatment, I walked by a centrifuge. The centrifuge was spinning and my right arm and leg went limp. When I backed up, they were normal. This apparently was due to the magnetic field that I was entering and my cells were so sick that they responded to it. The lab technician who was supposed to draw my blood explained that I was just electrically sensitive. It's very common in the clinic and not to worry about it. She turned off the centrifuge and I was fine. I later learned that people experiencing changes in blood flow in the brain related to EMF exposure have been documented, at least in the use of cell phones. There is an article on, uh, in the Journal of Cerebral Perfusion that um, explained the phenomenon that I was experiencing clinically. So I now avoid this by using a cell phone with air tubing. I can't put a cell phone to my head because I'm not stupid and I don't want to ever get sick again. So I use air tubing headset and um, I use a regular headset on all landline phones as well. Otherwise, I'm pretty normal, but I cannot hold telephones to my head for more than a minute or two or I don't feel well. Um, the other thing I'd like to discuss is the use of a charcoal mask. When we're sensitive to chemicals, it feels much better to wear some sort of protection so you don't have to breathe in the smell that seems to make one have a headache or get sick. The charcoal mask is um, usually something like this, like a bean bag, and it's heavy, and you put it up to your mouth. And te technically, it's sort of like heaven when you're really sensitive to initially have something to protect you. I know it looks weird, and I know that it um, may cause patients to be ostracized, but I do advise that people get a charcoal mask from either Dallas or another company so that they can protect themselves when they start to unmask and be more chemically sensitive. I um, was in Los Angeles when I initially was sick and I went back after treatment to get well and I had to live in a bubble because the outdoor air was so full of ozone I was unable to function outside unless I wore a mask all the time. Then I moved to Martha's Vineyard where the air was much cleaner and I began to heal. I wasn't allowed I wasn't able to leave the island for three years because I couldn't get near the ferry which had diesel exhaust. I couldn't get near uh, busy streets or freeways. So I stayed on the vineyard and eventually I got well by using the allergy shots I was given and uh, following some basic principles of environmental medicine and I'm lucky to have recovered. Uh, many people do not recover as I have and so I feel I'm representing um, you know, tens of millions of people who can't be here to tell their story or travel to a city. Uh, I feel very fortunate uh, to have the ability to give you this talk. Now I'm going to continue with the slides. So I mentioned this slide before and it talks about uh, steps 1 through 13. There are more treatments uh, available but I'm not going to go into great detail about each one of them except some of the ones here. So obviously, number one, getting away from mold or a chemical that may have started the whole process. So if you have a job and the job has a gas leak, obviously you don't go to work until the gas leak is fixed. In the same um, way, if you have a new carpeting in your office that's making you sick, as a physician, you need to tell the patient you will not get well if you keep going back to work and get exposed to that carpeting. So they need to change the carpeting, maybe open a window, put an air filter in, wait for it to outgas, but you can't keep going back to work because the patient will never improve and may develop chronic and disabling symptoms. Uh, the next area uh, in terms of treatment is self-education. So let's just see, I'm looking for a slide that I may have lost. So self-education has to do with what books to read, what books to tell your patient to read. There's a book called Living with Environmental Illness by Stephen Edelson. It's very easy and basic um, for any patient 
to read through the first night they've been seen. They can get through the first chapter. They understand about various principles of exposure, masking, uh, the Oasis bedroom. I recommend it highly. An alternative approach to allergies by Theron Randolph is a must read. It describes how he discovered the field and he relates food allergy and chemical exposure to behavior and psychiatric abnormalities. It's uh, fascinating how he discovered this through observation and listening to his patients. He used to type every word that they said without trying to organize the thoughts or make sense of them or judge them and eventually he discovered that the symptoms that people were having were related to things, as Doris Rapp would say, that they ate, touched, or smelled. And next we're talking about Doris Rapp, and she has many books. One is called Is This Your Child? Our Toxic World and The Impossible Child. She's a brilliant woman who's still alive, who's done uh, lectures on environmental health and been on Oprah over the last 30 years. She's been on Phil Donahue as well, and her videotapes are available at the University of Pennsylvania um, by the course directors of this uh, course. Sherry Rogers wrote a book called Tired or Toxic, as well as many others. These are more complicated to read and talk about um, the biochemistry of what's going on for a lay person. They have great diagrams and sketches and um, are a good second read once you have your head around the subject. There's a book called Mold and Mycotoxins, edited by Kilburn, and it's great background reference for everybody to have who's a researcher in the field and neurologist. It has uh, documentation of the abnormalities that occur and biomarkers in mold exposure. This includes uh, changes in conduction velocity with people with peripheral neuropathy and the development of antibodies to myelin, gangliocide, tubulin, and other substances in the body through molecular mimicry. Um, Carolyn Gorman has a book called Less Toxic Alternatives. It's a great resource uh, to keep on the shelf to know what to use when you want to kill the ants or you want to uh, use a supplement you don't know what it does. She describes uh, really a lot of important information in a uh, logical way in a small book. Bill Ray, or William Ray, wrote a four volume set called Chemical Sensitivity and um, it's really the uh, sort of encyclopedia of the field, and his new book, uh, which came out in 2010 with Dr. Patel, is called The Reversibility of Chronic Degenerative Disease and Hypersensitivity. And really, this is probably the leading book in the field at this time. Iris Bell wrote a very nice little book called Clinical Ecology, which I think um, medical students or people uh, should be able to read through and really get a sense of uh, why people um, get sick and the theory behind it. Um, there are some links. Uh, EHCD.com is for the Dallas Clinic and AAEM.com for the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And it lists the meetings, the teaching, uh, instructional courses, as well as how to find a physician. My website is environmentalmedicineinfo.com, but you can also use my name, Lisa Naj, which is N-A-G-Y, dot com because it's easier. Here's a copy of uh, Living with Environmental Illness. This is uh, Bill Ray's four volume set, which is I believe 6,000 pages, and I'm sure he'll get a new Nobel Prize for his contribution to the science, although he's not been well appreciated in his time unless he treated you. This is the Clinical Ecology book. Uh, number three on the treatment uh, list was suggestions for an oasis bedroom. So even if you feel fine, you should probably do some of these things to enhance your restful sleep and your detoxification overnight. If you're in a clean room, or some people would call a pure room at the hotel, um, it enhances your ability for the liver to work and get rid of toxins you were exposed to during the day as opposed to absorbing more toxins all night long. Uh, you should remove down pillows and comforter unless you're sure you're not allergic to down. You can do skin testing for down to make sure. This will often, or the, the down pillows itself, themselves will often lead to insomnia and uh, overheating at night and allergy symptoms, and people can get a bit manic at night if they're allergic to something in the bedroom, like down. You can order cotton pillows and blankets, and there's a company called Needs.com that supplies materials for people who are sensitive, like masks, cellophane bags for food, and pillows and blankets. Um, as well as supplements. 
I have no financial relationship, obviously, with any of these companies. Um, the furniture in the bedroom should be metal and glass, at, which is really best. Wood is really a problem for many of the patients because of the terpenes in wood. And the bedroom should have um, no newspapers or magazines either. There's a hard floor. If there's a hard floor, the patient will do much better. No carpeting is really acceptable. Once you have severe environmental illness, um, no patient would have a bedroom with carpeting. Uh, ceramic tile or marble will work, and um, the heat may be radiant floor or something that does not produce any fumes. Uh, electric heaters can work if they're radiant and they do not off-gas uh, paint smell from the plug-in electric radiator. Um, paint should be no VOC paint. You should test a sample of the painted piece of wood and sleep with it after it's outgassed to make sure that you're tolerant of the paint that you're going to put in your bedroom. And as I mentioned before, a charcoal air fil filter is a must. Um, and I'm going to say the names. Aerox is good for a bedroom and it has low EMF and the air filter needs to be changed maybe once a year. Austin Air has a HealthMate Junior Plus. It costs a little bit more. It does twice the square footage and it has more EMF. So I use those usually in larger rooms with higher ceilings and not the bedroom. Uh, no electric clock radio should be in the room or at least close to the bed. No lamps or telephones close to the bed and some patients have no tele uh, television as well. Well, when we talk about this number three, which is the avoidance of chemicals in air, food, water, and your habitat, and the oasis bedroom concept, this is a picture of an extreme variant of the oasis bedroom. Actually, it's sort of peace at last for the patient. It looks horrifying, but this is actually comforting when you're so miserable uh, everywhere you go. There's nowhere to rest. Um, this is like the last scene in the movie Safe, when, when Julianne Moore finds refuge in a room like this. Uh, it's the closing scene of the movie. And I refer people to watch the movie made over 25 years ago on this subject. So the fourth subject, in my mind, is managing the uh, hormone deficiencies. And adrenal function is paramount. Uh, many of the patients will have environmentally induced adrenal dysfunction because, as I mentioned uh, before, mold can cause adrenal insufficiency. And this was proven by Thurman in 1988 in an Army uh, publication on rats. And it hits female rats harder and is preventable with testosterone. So likewise, we need studies now on humans to look at what happens with um, mold exposure and the adrenal gland in human beings in buildings. And I will not go into all the management of the other hormones, but when people have a decline in the adrenal function, DHEA and testosterone will go down as well if you're a woman because we don't have testicles to produce those hormones. People feel better when you do hormone management, and that means fixing a, any hormone that is low, tuning all of them up, and making the person feel stronger so that they can cope with this devastating disease. So thyroid and adrenal go hand in hand. Um, all the serum hormones can be tested in serum as well as 24-hour um, uh, urine and saliva. So I'm going to go through some details. I get a standing aldosterone after standing for 15 minutes, um, and then the person sits down and they're drawn. It should be uh, not in the two, three, or four range. It should be above six or seven. And if it's very high, they may have Kahn's syndrome, which is the opposite of hypoadrenalism. Uh, pregnenolone is measured in the serum. Progesterone on 21 day of the cycle, on day 21 of the cycle. We measure estrogen, testosterone, total free and bioavailable, which is the best measurement. DHEA sulfate, dihydrotestosterone, IGF-1, which is a marker for growth hormone, insulin, cortisol, and I get the total and the free, an ACTH level, which would go up if you have Addison's disease, a TSH, a free T3, a total T3, and a reverse T3, which is an inhibitor of T3 function, as well as a free T4. And the antibodies for the thyroid are mentioned as well in hypothyroidism. I usually get four saliva cortisols, and the company that many people use is Diagnostics, and there are other companies uh, as well. Genova Diagnostics also does it. Um, some of them give you a free gliadin antibody, which is a 
very helpful tool to know if they should go off of wheat. And there's a measurement of immunity uh, called secretory IgA, uh, which is much better uh, than doing a blood test for it. Uh, I, th I believe I showed you a graph before of cortisol uh, over the um, day in the diurnal pattern, but this is a very important test to do to get an idea of free cortisol because that's what's excreted in the saliva. I do a 24-hour urine. You can use Rhine Lab or other labs and an aldosterone level, which you check off, and then you can compare your serum and your urine aldosterone to see if there is really a deficiency, and they agree. I do an ACTH stimulation test with one unit of intravenous ACTH, and the cortisol should be drawn at 30 and 60 minutes. Usually we do this in the morning at 8 o'clock. You place a HEPLOC, wait 30 minutes, wait for the patient to be calm and relaxed, and then draw the first sample while napping. It can be done in your office, is easy, and has low risk. The management of adrenal insufficiency. So this, te this uh, slide was originally used for a Lyme discussion. Uh, hence the word Lyme is in there, but um, you can't let the Addison's disease or moderate adrenal insufficiency go untreated uh, just because you feel they have a condition that could get worse if you gave them steroids. Normal cortisol replacement is imperative to function in life. Um, there's a very good book I mentioned at the bottom of the slide called The Safe Use of Hydrocortisone by Dr. Jeffries. Um, Jeffries and I spoke when he was in his 90s and I was just becoming sick and he has um, been working his whole life to explain that there is a low physiologic amount of cortisol or the hormone, the pill, Cortef, that could be given to people when they're hypoadrenal, even if they don't have full-blown Addison's disease, we can m miraculously help them deal with life. Um, the patients on history and physical would present this way if they're hypoadrenal. They'd be thin, they would tan easily, they could have hyperpigmented skin marks or the gums can have a purplish color. The blood pressure is often 100 systolic or less. They can be dizzy on standing because they don't have much aldosterone or mineralocorticoid effect. They crave salt or sugar. They have increased sense of smell, have fatigue, poor stress tolerance, headaches, they cry easily. And if you watch something sentimental like a commercial with puppies, they will sometimes weep. Um, and get emotional. The dosing of Cortef is roughly this way, about 10 milligrams in the morning, higher so you can get up, um, maybe even before you get out of bed, and then a five milligram tablet every four hours, and maybe two and a half milligrams at the uh, eight o'clock hour. It depends if you're a musician and playing a, a gig all night, or if you're a marathon runner. Obviously, when you do sports or in heat, you'll need more cortisol and should take so. Uh, you need to also increase um, the dosing uh, if they have cold or flu and double or triple it and you have to decrease it substantially when you start with a very chemically sensitive patient like a, a 1.25 milligrams a day uh, because they may have bizarre reactions because of their chemical sensitivity. So let's move on to the diagnosis of dysautonomia. POTS, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, is uh, sort of a clinical diagnosis, but it can be um, documented by doing a tilt table test at a cardiologist or a neurologist's office. And I think the people that deal with um, the dysautonomias feel that although it's a, a legitimate disease and condition or symptom, it is not well uh, maybe taught in medical school usually and not recognized to be uh, prevalent in people with chronic fatigue syndrome um, and also lead to panic attack. So here's a description of what it's like to have POTS. They can pretzel their legs while sitting. They, they wrap them to maintain uh, perfusion of the upper half of the body. They don't like to stand up and talk to people for very long with their legs apart. They like to lean on the wall, cross their legs, or um, fold their arms to maintain cerebral perfusion. The patient would always rather sit down. And really, sitting is essential in these patients. You should tell them not to stand up very long until they're treated. Um, it's a neurologic syndrome common in environmental patients, especially those with fibro, chronic fatigue syndrome, and chemical sensitivity, as well as some people with Lyme disease. The nerves aren't telling the veins to constrict. There's venous pooling in the legs, and it makes the legs feel heavy, although they look normal. There um, 
sometimes is a, is a reddish or bluish discoloration to the arms or legs in advanced cases from venous pooling. They can get exhausted or chilly after eating meals, so they feel cold after lunch. This is also from venous pooling in the gut, and they cannot function after they eat sometimes. In extreme cases, they'll fall asleep at the table. So they skip meals while they work because it would slow them down too much. I did this in the emergency room. If I ate a large meal, I'd be so tired I couldn't do my shift. So I never ate while working. Um, the heart rate is usually 20 beats faster on standing than lying. You should never really use sitting because it just gets in the way, so I don't bother. You always do uh, the vital signs 60 seconds after they stand up or lie down and change position. And you can wait longer and see if the heart rate continues to go up like you're doing a tilt table. Um, if you stand them for five minutes, does the heart rate go from 80 to 90? If you stand them for 10 minutes, does it go 100? This is obviously a sign that they have POTS. Um, it just takes a little bit longer to do your physical exam, but once you make this diagnosis and start treating them, they will feel much better and really appreciate the time you took. Um, in order to maintain heart rate, blood pressure, with POTS, people release a lot of adrenaline. They get revved up, they speak fast, they get anxious, um, and sometimes they will have a surge of adrenaline which will lead to dysautonomic crisis. And this is often uh, what a panic attack uh, is based on. Not in all cases, but a persistent standing can lead to this um, apparent panic attack. The treatment is IV fluids and Valium or Ativan. Um, here's a slide on the trial of medication for POTS, which is really very easy to treat. Uh, so I'm going to go into it in detail. You start lo low and you work up over three days. Uh, immediate treatment is medication-based uh, and it, after uh, a couple years of treatment the patient may no longer need these medications. So first I start with Florinef and here it tells you how to take it. 0.1 milligrams, one to three tabs at night, if the aldosterone is low in the urine especially. Midadrine is the other drug we use. It's an alpha agonist and it constricts the veins. 2.5 milligrams is a starting dose and up to 10 to 20 milligrams every four hours while awake. Basically 10 milligrams is a high dose, but some patients do need 20. It's not to be taken after maybe seven o'clock in the evening because um, people lie down and this is not a drug to be used when you're gonna lie down. So if you're gonna go have acupuncture or you're gonna go have a massage or take a nap, you should not take your midadrine because it will give you supine hypertension. Check the standing heart rate 90 to 120 minutes after taking the dose and decide if the heart rate is improved. If the patient still has tachycardia, go up on the dose. And you can do this over just a few days. Um, then you go to five milligrams, 7.5 milligrams, and 10 milligrams until the heart rate is the same as it is lying when you stand or they don't get tired after they're eating and that symptom is improved. You know when it is too much when the scalp itches uncontrollably. And this is like a goosebump effect on the scalp, not related to allergy, but related to autonomic function. And if a little itching occurs, that's normal. If it passes in 10 minutes, we're okay. But if the patient has constant itching for an hour and can't bear it, then you've exceeded the dose that the patient needs. Eventually, uh, untreated with prolonged standing, I mentioned that the blood pressure could go up and you could have this uh, horrible feeling of panic. So it's advisable to get the patients treated and in the meantime to tell them not to do anything with prolonged standing. Other treatments include stockings, salt, and the avoidance of situations that make dysautonomia worse. This is heat, standing up for a long time, large meals, exercise, toxic air, like going into the mall or being in a moldy house, and in some patients with EMF intolerance, magnetic fields. So you could be sitting in front of the computer and you need to pretzel your legs after you've been there for an hour because you have difficulty ma maintaining blood pressure and heart rate. Um, there's a website for dysautonomia called NDRF, National Dysautonomia Research Foundation org. And if you look under POTS, it'll describe some of these things. And I'd like to say that my hypothesis is that 
there's a possibility that essential hypertension is often a result of untreated dysautonomia, which is then related to environmental exposure. When you give midodrine to a patient with hypertension on this basis, the blood pressure will drop in such patients and they will no longer have their essential hypertension. Uh, this is my experience from reading information on the website and treating patients with hypertension as well as tachycardia.